as my title says it's a common disease of brain in dogs we are going to see so the basics of neurology already we have taken in the last session and uh, i think uh, to understand this you need to understand the basics first that's why i uh, did the beginning with the basics of everything total neurology and including the anatomical things of brain spinal cord and autonomic nervous system so now we will go into the common disease of brain in dogs uh to start with first i'll refresh your uh, signs of uh, four brain um um sorry for the mistake there it's four brain is one word okay and also the other areas of brain first we'll see then uh, we will go into the individual diseases so as you all know the four brain signs of four brain disease primary one will be the seizures so when you see seizures you can suspect the signs in the cerebral cortex and in the thalamus and uh, seizures uh, with various reasons there can be seizures or it can be in a idiopathic uh, epilepsy as you see in the middle aged dogs some breeds are prone for it like golden retrievers shepherds german shepherds so seizure is the main sign of a four brain lesion then comes your behavioral change and uh, you will have loss of train the trained behaviors will be lost and it will uh, it it will fail to recognize the owners even there will be some kind of aggression as you see in the early part of rabies some hyper excitability will be there then there can be an altered mental status uh, starting from apathy dis uh, depression disorientation lethargy and even the comato stage it depends on which stage the disease is rather than that it will have abnormal movements uh, or postures example the circling the circling with the related to the four brain lesions it will have a white circling it won't have a uh, tight or narrow circle generally be white circling but uh, that's not a hard and fast rule sometimes in puppies with uh, severe hydrocephalus we see a tight cycling pivoting the hind limbs there will be pacing there will be wandering and there may be head pressing so you see a, a picture here the animal showing head pressing going to corners and he is just pressing the head because of increased cs of pressure and uh, this video will show you the uh, wandering sorry you see uh, without it's it's a person aimless wandering just moving here and there without knowing what it is doing this is a sign of a uh, four brain disease cerebral disease especially the cerebral cortex you can see is moving here and there owner is somewhere it's in the outpatient unit we saw it is simply moving without in home also it is always doing it for 24 hours it's moving around just like this without any aim you will hear other extraneous noises please bear with me because it's recorded uh, the word uh, uh you will have a uh, postural uh, deficits in the uh, uh, usually the deficits will be contralateral opposite side of the lesion you know that and especially in the cerebral cortex and thalamus below that you will have ipsilateral deficits on the same side uh, <clears throat> regarding uh, cerebral cortex and thalamus it will be uh, contralateral deficits and uh, you will have deficits in the postural reactions that is uh, when you are going to test it for uh, uh, conscious proprioception hemi standing hemi walking wheel barrowing all those postural reactions you will have contralateral deficits you have contralateral deficit deficits in the vision you will have deficits in the menes response and also in the facial sensation next comes your signs of mid brain and generally as we saw earlier the cerebral cortex that is the cerebral cortex and thalamus you don't have much uh, uh, changes in the movement 
it is not paralyzed and will be still moving around. That's the beauty of it. But in case of midbrain lesions, you will see human paresis or paralysis of all four limbs. Or if the lesion is restricted to one side, then it will be on the contralateral side. And there will be partial reaction deficits in all four limbs. Or if the lesion is on one side, the, uh, then uh, the signs on the contralateral side. Then you will have a mental depression or coma. Then you will have an ipsilateral oculomotor or trochlear deficits. Uh, if the lesion is on the uh, other side, you will have the contralateral, uh, sorry, ipsilateral, not contralateral. On the same side of the lesion, you will have that deficits on the uh, trochlear. <clears throat> and you may find some degree of hyperventilation since the respiratory center is involved. You see here, this <clears throat> it was hit by a football. Few kids uh, brought this. Uh, they said while playing, they hit. And uh, from the, uh, that day, it is having a lesion like this. You see a convergent strabismus here. <clears throat> Maybe it's due to the lesion in the midbrain. Maybe it's edematous because of the injury. <clears throat> Coming to the signs of the uh, hypothalamus, you here also you see a normal gait. And uh, sometimes you see altered mental status also, you're a little disoriented, lethargy and comatose, and also change in behavior. And you will see the bilateral optic uh, nerve deficit. And you will have abnormal movements like circling, pacing, wandering, head pressing, trembling, all those signs that belongs to cerebrum. Then you will have abnormal temperature regulation, abnormal appetite, the endocrine disturbances, as you all know, um, the pituitary is there. Any pituitary tumor can end up with this type of uh, uh, can cause a pituitary tumor can cause this type of uh, signs if it's big enough to impinge on the other structures of the brain. <coughs> then you have uh, you may have seizures also in this. <clears throat> it's a it little bit a tight circle, as I said. It is not wandering. It's a little bit a tight circle. So usually, I see this type of tight circling in puppies. Do you see this? This is another type of circling. It's a little wider, not very tight. It's a little wider. This you can see in the vestibular disease as well as in, in the cerebral disease as well. It's doing involuntarily without any reason. Then the signs of brain stems, usually it will have an ipsilateral hemiparesis or asymmetrical tetraparesis. That paresis means weakness, paralysis means it's completely not able to use the lips. And you will have upper motor neurons. Why always we see say as upper motor neuron sciences? Because you are, uh, I mean, your nuclei that is the upper motor nuclei is in the cerebral cortex and the axons run down through the brain to the spinal cord up to the level of the elements so any head signs you will be you will see only the upper motor neuro signs that is all rigidity of uh, limbs and stiffness of the limbs rather than the flaccidity then you have cranial nerve deficits for five seven nine five to seven or also nine to twelve and all, most of the cranial nerves originate from the brain stem so whenever you see uh, cranial nerve deficits, uh, you can relate with brainstem. And there will be an ipsilateral. Ipsilateral in sense on the same side of the lesion. Contralateral opposite side of the lesion. Usually up to the, uh, I mean, uh, thalamus. Up to the thalamus in that level, it will have a contralateral signs. Below that, it starts as ipsilateral. You may have altered mental status especially depression and sometimes irregular respiration because the respiratory center is there, for instance. Then the signs of the cerebellum. As you all know, it will have ataxia because your movement, your gait is controlled by the cerebellum. Ataxia, 
or it can have a, a tremors. Usually we call this as an intentional tremors because whenever it is going for some act like drinking water or eating, it will end up in tremors. It's called intentional tremors. Then hypermetry, of course, uh, is an exaggeration in the gait, you will see. You will have a broad-based stance. You may have uh, menace deficits, normal vision. What it means is your menace will be absent, but still animal is able to see. You, with the menace alone, you cannot test uh, your vision. That's why you have obstacle testing. With the menace, you can, it, it's, a, it's a type of reflex uh not directly related to vision of course it can be accompanied with the vision loss also any cerebral lesion can cause deficits in the menace and uh, it can have a normal vision it may, it may not bump into objects usually you don't see much weakness uh, so see this video it's a uh, first i Show this one. You can see a broad based stance, you can see. And also see the uh, movement. Uh, that's, that's a type of tremors you can see. And sometimes you see the back limb is lifting uh, for the balance. It can go, go the other way also. It may go the other way also. See, it's lifting, uh, so balance. it's losing the balance, okay. Same way, this animal, as you can see, how wide and how the gait is exaggerated. Huh? Then it's coming to the signs of vestibular disease, uh, vestibular uh, lesions. Uh, usually, you see it very commonly. It is predominantly the head tilt, you see, and also the nystagmus. Nystagmus can be uh, a positional nystagmus. That means at normal position, it will have nystagmus. And if you don't, have nystagmus in normal position. If you're going to change the position of the head or the body, it may develop nystagmus. That we call it as a positional nystagmus. It can be a, a vertical, horizontal, or rotatory, uh, depending on the uh, area of involvement. Usually, uh, horizontal and rotatory, uh, in case of uh, a peripheral vestibular disease, and all in case of a central vestibular disease. It can be a taxic, it can have ipsilateral postural reaction deficits, it can have altered mental status, and also it can have other cranial nerve signs. Because some part of the vestibular is controlled from the cerebellum also. So this is a typical, see the head tilt. One ear is below the other ear, and you also see obvious nystagmus. Also, you see the obvious nystagmus, and see how it's losing the balance. You see, that's a, a horizontal nystagmus. You see there, and. This is the one which shows severe vertical nystagmus. Probably uh, it may be a central vestibular disease. That uh, differentiation when we are dealing with vestibular disease, we just go through this differentiation. Okay, so that's in general about uh, what are the signs of the uh, involvement of various regions of the brain. Now we'll uh, go into the CSF collection procedure because uh, that is a, a very important uh, diagnostic aid which is available to us because we don't have access to MRI or CT. So uh, some information we get from the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So you all know it needs a general anesthesia. And if you are right-handed, put the animal in right tilt recumbency so that uh, you can easily access uh, with head flexed at right angles. And uh, this line, how to draw, how to identify the position, I'll have a video, I'll show it. Just you draw a line quarterly uh, from the occipital protuberance and also one horizontal line uh, from the wing of the atlas. Okay, that line intersection is the point where you have to prick. Actually, that is not the actual point. It is midway between the occipital protuberance and 
this junction you have to click i'll just show you how to do it and uh, how you feel that you uh, how do you know in september you feel uh, some degree of change in texture when you appear in it a pop like or uh, some uh, feel of uh, change in texture you you uh, feel when you're doing uh, piercing the needle and usually we use a 22 20 or 22 gauge uh, spinal needle or even you can use a ordinary hypodermic needle if you are very confident of doing it sometimes you need a bigger needle for a uh, giant breeds 2.5 inch and generally it is not advisable to aspirate with syringe it should dribble down because when you're trying to aspirate it may you may damage the nervous tissues or it may herniate all those things there and make sure that it is uh, having a normal like pressing or uh, that maniacal behavior of wandering should be there but very difficult to assess the series of pressure and uh, sorry just i'll run the video how to okay so first you anesthetize it and this is a so the central palpate the wing of the atlas and draw a horizontal line there draw a horizontal line there then you just mark the arcs, occipital protuberance if you want you can mark it that's occipital protuberance and then midway between that that's the site you can palpate it and once you're confident that you can do it then you can just occipital protuberance make sure uh, that's a wing of atlas i'm these two fingers are uh, these two fingers are at the wing of the atlas and my index finger is on the oxygen protuberance just ask him to hold it properly if you want you can intubate it to be very sure is that yeah that's the half frame mark and just i'm using the regular hypodermic needle there it's a 20 gauge 1.5 inch needle and just i'm adjusting the head so that i can go in between and you see a clear uh, flow flow there it should dribble down so around one to two ml you can collect for examination okay and if you see blood there uh, probably you hit a vessel there and you're not exactly on the midline you can take it out and you can retry that and if you see something like in a lowish color, that may be the old hemorrhage. That will have the xanthochromia will be there. That will be a little yellowish. Okay. Uh, what are the things you see in the CSFS? You have to see the uh, total count and differential count. You all know about it. Cytological examination, in what type of cells you commonly see, and also the uh, protein estimation additionally if you're suspecting for distemper you can do a pcr with it you can do a bacterial culture if you're suspecting a bacterial meningitis but that is very rare to happen canines and you are even you can use a uh, for serology of uh, uh, canine distemper okay um, and normally the csf fluid will be clear and colorless uh, like water you all know about it and the white blood cell count is less than 5WBC, if you're doing a systemal puncture, there'll be some variation between the lumbar puncture and the systemal puncture. And uh, <clears throat> in case of a lumbar puncture, you see predominantly mononuclear cells. And the total protein will be of uh, less than 0.25 gram per liter from the systemal puncture. And lumbar puncture will be almost twice this level. So there is some difference between the systemal and the lumbar puncture. That you have to take, in, take into account when you are interpreting the uh, Results. What are the typical findings in specific diseases? It may have a neutrophilic pleocytosis in case of a steroid responsive meningitis arthritis. Um, this disease we'll see in the coming slides. Neutrophilic pleocytosis, that is, you will have WBCs and predominantly neutrophils, especially in the acute phase of SRMA. In the chronic phase of SRMA, it will be a mononuclear pleocytosis, more of lymphocytes and monocytes. 
rather than neutrophils. So that you see in case of GME. In case of GME, you see a mononuclear or mixed pleocytosis. And uh, if the neutrophilic pleocyte is too marked, it can be a bacterial meningitis, but it is very rare, as I said. And you can do a culture also if you uh, see a neutrophilic pleocytosis. And the fluid is yellow tinged, then it, it's old hemorrhage, which happened. Not during a collection. During a collection, it will be a fresh blood or blood tinged fluid. Uh, if it's an old hemorrhage, then you will have an yellowish, you will see an yellowish fluid. Okay, then this is in general about uh, the common signs of uh, brain and then uh, brain lesions and then how to collect CSF and how to interpret it. Then coming to the broad classification of brain diseases, we can see in these headings as a congenital infectious, inflammatory, immune mediated, ischemic, degenerative disease, we don't have much except for a certain kind of storage disease, which is degenerative, we are not going to deal with it. And just I will give an introduction about what are the neoplasties available. We are not going to deal in detail about it. Okay, coming to congenital, congenital hydrocephalus, you all know about it. It's excessive accumulation of uh, cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles, particularly in the later ventricles of the brain. Once there is a severe accumulation, naturally there is going to be signs of brain dysfunction. Why it accumulates, just before going into how it happens, you should understand the normal uh, anatomy and physiology. These are the ventricles, the picture which is showing, these are the ventricles, and uh, <clears throat> these two are the lateral ventricles, and third and the fourth ventricles you can see here. These are two views of it. This is where the CSF fluid is circulated. Hatred Pharma introduces Hatcord DS, Prednisolin Sodium Phosphate, 10 mg per 5 ml oral solution. The ultimate power of steroid with double strength. Prednisolin sodium phosphate oral solution. Hatcot DS serum. Glucocorticoid systemic drug. Indications anti inflammatory and immunosuppressive. Dosage for dogs 0.5 mg to 1 mg per kg per day. For cats, 1 to 2 mg per kg per day. Root, oral. Presentation, 60 ml. You can book your order online at www.hatwit.com. Looking forward to a long lasting business association. Thank you. <clears throat> How it is produced? It is produced from the choroid plexus of the ventricle and it's an energy dependent mechanism involving the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Plus, the brain cellular elements also produce some CSF, predominantly from the choroid plexus. And the production is unaffected by the increase in the intracranial pressure, a uh, change in the intracranial pressures. And uh, uh, how it moves around within the ventricles is uh, from lateral to third ventricle, it is through interventricular foramen, and from the third to fourth is through the meson mesencephalic aqueduct. From fourth, it runs into the subarachnoid space. So even the mesencephalic aqueduct obstruction can also cause a distribution of the ventricles. <clears throat> and the cerebrospinal fluid is absorbed by the arachnoid villi as well as by the capillaries throughout the brain. So that is, let's keep on getting interchanged and doesn't increase the pressure much. Okay. What happens actually in hydrocephalus is the conventional theory is that it is because the ventricular magnet, because obstruction to the ventricular system, as I said, mesencephalic aqueduct stenosis can cause the distension of the ventricles. Or it can be an insufficient absorption of the cerebrospinal fluid in the venous system at the arachnoid villi. This is an old concept which is called bulb flow concept, which means the arachnoid villi is the one which absorbs the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, to maintain the levels. If it fails, uh, it keeps on accumulating, causing the hydrocephalus. That's a old school thought. <clears throat> Presently, they have a theory called hydrodynamic theory, where the brain capillaries uh, remain open throughout the entire cardiac cycle, that is during systole and diastole. <clears throat> so much of the cerebrospinal fluid is absorbed during this phase at the capillary level, rather than that the arachno arachnoid villi. 
and uh, since uh, the hydrocephalus uh, cephalic patients are to have a, are believed to have a poor intracranial compliance of the vasculatures uh, it ends up in the poor absorption of the uh, cerebrospinal fluid <clears throat> okay what do you see in the physical examination in patients with uh, hydrocephalus you see a, a, a large dome shaped head almost like a dome as you see here and also an open fontanelle which you can palpate here and if you don't you can manually palpate it and you see this in x-ray there is no bone here okay so thin and it's open only tissue is there covering it open fontanelle or a large calvarial defects can be there a bigger opening <clears throat> and it can have a, a bilateral uh, i'm just moving this really you will see a, a bilateral ventrolateral strabismus ventral as well as lateral it goes ventral as well as lateral ventrolateral strabismus and it can have an obtuned mentation it's more lethargic like okay <clears throat> it's a some degree of lethargy have behavior about it is circling pacing restlessness and seizure activities can be there i'll just show a video you see this is a uh, puppy you can see the large boom shaped head and you you see the circling it's a typical circling i've seen many times in case of a, a hydrocephalus the hind limb will be pivoted and will be moving around I've seen few such cases. Okay. And how to diagnose it? Yeah, it's very difficult to do with the regular, uh, you need a CT or MRI for that. But if this fontanel is open, you can use your ultrasound even. You can use your linear probe ultrasound or you can access if you have a, uh, a, a smaller uh, curvilinear probe, microconvex, you can use uh, from behind, uh, or you can use through the uh, open fontanelles to assess to see the ventricles of the ventricles, or you have to go for an advanced uh, imaging procedure. And how to manage this is um you can do a medical management by using uh, prednisolone uh, diuretics like uh, furosemide acetazolamide and sometimes omeprazole so also that has a role in uh, bringing uh, re reducing the csf production so these are all the agents which will reduce the production of csf and uh, symptomatically if you want to treat you have to use anticonvulsants and uh, I, you know, all know uh, it's very difficult to manage medically. You need a, you need a permanent uh, solution. You need have to go for a surgery. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not a surgeon to discuss on this, but since many surgeons are practicing, you can try this. You can do a ventricular peritoneal shunting. The ventricular peritoneal shunts, which is available for human one, you can use it uh, for dogs. Not too costly also. Owners are very affordable. You can do it, but it's a permanent thing. You have to fix it in the uh, ventricles. There you have a, and then you are putting the drain into the peritoneum. Okay. If you have an appropriate equipmentation to drill it and put it inside, uh, you can try this one. Not a very complicated procedure. Some degree of expertise is needed here. Okay. And that's about the hydrocephalus. Uh, I'm not going to cover the entire thing because I even I'm not exposed to so many syndromes. Very rarely you come across few syndromes, and very difficult to confirm because of limitations of going in for an MRI or CT. The one thing we see usually is the shaking puppy syndrome. That is a newborn pups. You see this type of signs. You see, this is called shaking puppy syndrome, and. Uh, it may not be able to walk properly it is always be shaking like this maybe it will start around a month for four weeks and then uh, in case of a mild degree it will recover in four or five months but if it's a little severe it will take even a one year to recover but there is no accurate treatment for it okay so this is because of the hypomyelination in the accents of the cns that's the reason and uh, 
it's an inherited disorder usually seen in golden retriever wire runner and dalmatian there is no uh, treatment uh, available for this and uh, as i said less severe cases will recur in three to four months but very severe cases will recur it may take a year and a half to recover then the other common thing you come across is the uh, cerebellar hyperplasia this is what you can see some type of jerky movement it won't have a proper uh, and uh, as i said this is because of uh, some degree of infection or toxins at the, uh, the embryonic thing which causes the hyperplasia the embryonic stage it can happen it's having a wide base stance and it's it's a typical typical cerebellar uh, hyperplasia um usually not at birth uh, so probably around 6 week, weeks of age only it develops uh, because there is the, the process happening during that period it can be a genetic or it can be an infection or a poisoning or a malnutrition anything can cause this you have an incoordination jerky movement uh, dysmetria internal intentional tremors all those things you can appreciate uh, as you see in other cerebellar disease and as i said there is no treatment for it either animal have to live with it or if the signs are very severe it cannot live with it then you have to euthanize it the other one which we call it is a white shaker syndrome it is uh, uh, mostly the white coated dogs will have best highland white terriers maltese poodles all this develop this disease and immune mediated uh, uh etiology suspected age of onset is around 1 to 2 years not in puppies usually in adult stage you see this you will have full body tremors in small breeds and these this disease will respond very well to corticosteroids so once you see a um, adult dog around 1 to 2 years developing this type of tremors uh, after ruling out the other causes other possible causes which you can do it if you are cornering it as a white shaker syndrome which has a white coat then you can think about using corticosteroids it has a good prognosis with corticosteroids then coming to the infectious disease and as you all know canine distemper is the most common infectious disease i am not going to deal anything about canine distemper because you are well versed and you all know about it and you i would have come across regularly and as you all know it's a two forms as a gi form most of the time you won't see gi form and uh, and the other form is a respiratory sometimes you come again like come across a respiratory form with severe pneumonic signs you will have a, a clear cut uh, purulent nasal discharge in case of a distemper uh, other than that i don't see most of the time purulent nasal discharge mainly in distemper only we see and of course uh, once uh, uh, from the mucosal form gi and respiratory it goes into nerves then you will develop <clears throat> all sorts of chewing gum seizures tremors features paresis paralysis all those things will develop and these are the some of the drugs which have to be considered some degree of dancing so perhaps they it will be a very graceful dancing sometimes you call it a saint fighter's dance it's very graceful dancing you see when the dog is moving around this is suffering actually that's quite involuntary you cannot use any uh, anti convulsant to stop this okay and this is the chewing gum seizures you see commonly with the distemper you can see that's a typical distemper chewing gum seizures the other correlate other signs it, it may not be a, it's not a pathognomonic for distemper it's one of the signs of distemper and here the anti convulsant will help you can see the forehead twitching also very clearly <clears throat> once you see the signs then naturally you have to go for confirmation if you want to do it you can give the prognosis owner if you want to confirm it you can do an rt pcr with the serum or from the csf yeah, or you have to do a look for the inclusion borders 
and uh, in the tissues once uh, that is usually the postmortem coming to the treatment of distemper as you all know there is no treatment available whatever so many papers are there on uh, using uh, homeopathy using certain vaccines against it, but it's not quite effective antivirals are not effective so mostly it's supportive treatment and the vaccine is you all know we use a modified live vaccine and um, it requires an uh, annual revaccination apart from the uh, primary and boosters and there is a possibility of developing vaccination distemper also since we are using a modified live vaccine if you give a shot of this it may develop in uh, two to three weeks it may develop signs of distemper that is possible and we have something called old dog encephalitis that is uh, something a latent uh, distemper and uh, it it may not be visible until uh, the old age uh, that the damage it's causing will show some signs of uh, nerve signs especially in the brain we, dog, we call it as old dog encephalitis uh, uh, it happens in case of distemper the other very common disease we come across in our practice is rabies rabies is so endemic in our country and uh, and uh, uh, we call it as a furious form and dumb form traditionally, but very rarely you see furious form. Maybe we skip more, most of the time, we don't see it. When it's presented, in mostly it'll be a dull, dumb form towards this. And um, what are the signs? You just look at this video. That's, you see an incoordination in the gate. That's the one usually we see, and you see uh, open mouth, dropped jaw, and you see the drunk uh, uh, drooping of the tongue. And uh, the tongue gets necrosed, and uh, it will be discolored. We call it as a copper colored tongue. And it can't, it will have that hydrophobic nature. It won't drink water. It will be uh, so disoriented. And uh, so it's very difficult to handle at these stages. Better not to handle. So usually, once we see the signs, we'll put under observation for rabies. And once it dies, we'll do a postmortem. We'll uh, do a histopathology. And then we'll do a FAT to confirm it. That's a typical rabies dog. And... Uh, how to send the tissues? Uh, you can send the brain tissues in past a past fed buffered solution, refrigerated if possible. If it's not able to do a refrigeration, uh, you put it under 50% glycerol along with past fed buffer saline. Uh, don't use formalin. Formalin, you can't do a serological testing if you're using formalin. And what are the tests they do generally is the uh, histopathology, looking for the nigri bodies, which is not a very confirmative test. You have to go for FAT, fluorescent antibody technique. And if the FAT fails, that rarely happens. If it fails, then you have to go for a mouse inoculation test. You collect the one, you, in, you put it in the mouse, wait for three weeks, then uh, slaughter it, and then you do the FAT again in the mouse. To do a serological testing for uh, 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 transporting the animals from one country to other, then you have to do an RFFIT or uh, you do a virus neutralization test. Uh, these tests are done at uh, Bangalore Veterinary College as well as in Madras Veterinary College, they do this technique. Hatwood Pharma introduces Hatclav 375 tablets, Amoxicillin 250 mg plus Potassium Clovinate 125 mg, Potentiated Amino Penicillin Systemic Drug, Bactericidal amino penicillin with beta lactamase inhibitor with extended spectrum of antibacterial activity. Amoxicillin and potassium clovinate tablets. Indications for treatment of urinary tracts, skin, and soft tissue infections caused by susceptible organisms, particularly gram positive bacteria and anaerobes. Indicated for canine periodontal disease due to susceptible strains of bacteria and for treatment of bacterial respiratory tract infections. Dosage for dogs 
13.75 mg per kg for cats 62.5 mg per cat every 12 hours for 5 to 7 days or 48 hours root oral presentation 1 into 10 tablets you can book your order online at www.hatwit.com looking forward to a long lasting business association thank you earlier this was done at ut also in their pasture institute but uh, right now they're not doing it so what commonly you see is signs of rabies will be the drooping of jaw abnormal barking dry droopy tongue what you seen in that animal abnormal licking of water regurgitation altered behavior biting and eating on inanimate ob objects lapica we call it as no the aggression biting without any provocation running without any apparent reasons it was wandering no because of the cerebral involvement stiffness uh, upon running and walking and uh, little when in the dumb form it will be appearing little sleepy also and there will be an imbalance in the gait these are the signs commonly you see it's not an exhaustive list it's a partial list of what signs you will see like this so that that is about the infectious disease i'm touching only the common things what we come across and uh, what is treatable commonly this is the very common one we saw we call it as a granulomatous meningoencephalitis it's called gme in short it's an idiopathic disease uh, but it's an inflammatory one idiopathic inflammatory disease of cns and it is it can be a focal or a disseminated one uh, this, you see a focal or disseminated granulomatous lesions throughout the brain as well as in the spinal cord it's a non superative meningitis and by HP, you see something called a perivascular cuffing of mononuclear cells. You see, that is a vessel, in the, that's a HP of it, that's a vessel. And all those cells are the mononuclear cells cuffing around it. This is what, it's a, it's a typical one of any type of inflammatory brain disease, especially GME, NME, uh, all the, these, there's something we call it as a leukocytic uh, necrotizing meningoencephalitis, all those things. Although we call it as an idiopathic disease, some degree of immune-mediated uh, cause is suspected. So that's why this disease is more responsive to corticosteroids or any type of immunosuppressive agents. So GME can involve usually small breeds, young to middle age, more in females. But it can be, it can happen in any breed, any age, and any sex also. I'm saying it's most commonly, but it cannot come to a shepherd, cannot come to a laboratory. It can happen. There are usually three forms. Focal, which carries a good prognosis. The other one is disseminated, which is a little uh, uh, bad prognosis compared to focal. And one is a ocular form, which, is involved, which will cause optic neuritis. And uh, it may involve all parts of the brain, starting from cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, vestibular, everything. You see, you see most of the signs here. So just you look at this video, so suspected to be of having a, a GME. You see how dressy, drowsy is it? it is. Mostly disoriented. And, uh, and even you can see the eyelids are also closed a little. And uh, just watch its movement. Uh, all it, it, uh, that's a typical uh, hypermetria, dysmetria, I can call it as. And you can you can see that in the gait also. Once it is, uh, moving. it's a little longer video. You can watch it how it's moving around. Okay, it can have this type of vestibular signs also in case of a GME. In pugs, uh, it is not only NME you see commonly, you see uh, uh, 
this type of vestibular signs in GME. Okay. So how will you diagnose this? Uh, simply it is based on your uh, CSF only. You can get a clue that it may be a case of GNV and you can start your treatment. The early part of the GME generally you will have, uh, not an early part, usually it will have a mononuclear pleocytosis. That is predominantly uh, it will have uh, more lymphocytes. First thing, increase in number of cells and then more of uh, lymphocytes and uh, monocytes and a few macrophages. You don't see much uh, neutrophils here. If you want a confirmation, you have to do a brain biopsy. That is not possible. So we'll just stick on to the CSF. You may get clues with the MRI also, but uh, it's beyond our uh, access. So how to treat this, as I say, uh, prednisolone is the mainstay in the treatment. Uh, you can use prednisolone at the dose rate of one to two milligram per kg, or you can do a procarbazine. It's an antiplastic, it's an alkylating agent, basically. Um, it's a cytotoxic agent, yeah? okay. And the dose is around 25 to 50 milligram per meter square per day. You can combine this both. The one, one paper is there, uh, a combination of uh, prednisolone and procarbazine is very effective in case of a GME. And uh, if you're done with prednisolone and a lot of side effects related to prednisolone, then you can switch over to leflunamide, uh, which is a, again an immunosuppressive agent, uh, not a steroid. So that you can try that one. Apart from that, you have to use some anti-epileptics if you seek uh, epilepsy very commonly. But epilepsy is not a common sign of GME. So when you see a pug with GME, it is treatable. You cannot declare it as an enemy directly. Uh, best thing to do as a uh, CSF. In case of a CSF, you see a mononuclear pleocytosis. That is more of lymphocytes and uh, monocytes. You have uh, the other disease called necrotizing encephalitis, which is a very fatal disease. You all know about it. It's a very fatal disease. Earlier it was called as a pug dog encephalitis uh, since they thought it's only in pugs, but of late many breeds are involved. So it is simply necrotizing encephalitis. And one peculiarity of this is it is mostly involving the cerebrum and thalamus. So uh, mostly it is a prosencephalic signs uh, like a lethargy, blindness, uh, with normal PLR. So that is central blindness. It is bl you, you check the PLR, it will be normal, but the animal will be still blind. That is, we call it a central blindness. And um, yeah, you will have a circling, head pressing, all the signs of involving the cerebrum. Very rarely you see a cerebellar vestibular uh, signs. It can happen, but very rarely you see. And if it is more of a cerebellar vestibular signs, you just think about uh, GME rather than NME. And um, you may see a cervical pain and rigidity if there is some involvement of the uh, meningitis, uh, sorry, uh, meninges and uh, the areas where the CSF is circulated. If, uh, Having a leptomeningeal involvement, you can think about a cervical pain and rigidity, but that is not so common in necrotizing meningitis encephalitis. Mostly, it will be something like a, a, a lethargy, uh, as most signs of uh, cerebral signs, like head pressing, uh, seizures, which can be a partial or general seizures, and something like weakness, some syncopacy like signs also you can see, you see. And it may develop some degree of partial seizures. It is so weak to walk, and it may fall down, and it may have partial seizures you may think it's a stereotype you may have a confusion whether it's a stereotype or uh, seizures okay so if it is an acute phase you will have mild cellular infiltration but it's a subacute it will have intense and in case of a chronic disease it may take a course of around uh, even six months to uh, progress uh, you will have a extensive brain necrosis so it is a usually a fatal disease you can try immunosuppressive drugs. If it is a, a GME, it will click. But in NME, usually it will progress to death. So there's no 
uh, it's when it goes into a chronic form, it is not treatable. It will have a severe necrosis of brain tissues. Most uh, treatable one is uh, the steroid res responsive meningitis arthritis. It is called SRMA. So we have, we have seen GME, which is in, we have seen GME, which is involving all parts of the brain. Whereas NME, as I said, it is more predominantly towards the cerebrum. And this one, it is a, a more a leptomeningeal disease. So that's why you see the cervical rigidity, pain, and pyrexia. Even it's a multifocal disease. And another peculiarity of this, it will have more of a uh, neutrophilic pleocytosis. In, usually in acute form. Maybe in a chronic form, it may develop a mononuclear CSF pleocytosis. That is more of lymphocytes and uh, monocytes. But usually it is neutrophilic pleocytosis. So this patient, and this disease, usually earlier it was reported more commonly in beagles. That's why we call it as a, a beagle pain syndrome. But uh, this video which I'm showing, this is a, a Basenji. You all know about it, uh, the Basenji. And this dog earlier I've seen at the young age. It, this was around five, six years of age. In two years of age, uh, we did a urine test. It had a severe glucosuria. It was around 1,000 milligram. So then we thought it may ha having a Fanconi syndrome, which is very common in uh, Basenji's. It's an inherited disease in Basenji's. And there is, it's a type of uh, defect in the kidneys. Uh, it will have glucosuria. And then it had a pyometra and they have done a surgery. Then after three, four, four, five years, it developed this type of acute uh, pain. You see that, that cervical rigidity and it was having extreme pain. You can see how carefully it walks. It will be howling with pain and, and even to sit and lie down. Initially, they thought it may be having a spinal cord involvement, all those things. They have done uh, x-rays, CT, MRI. He's a human doctor. They did MRI also. MRI, they were not able to find much lesions, but because we are not able to read it properly, but CT, nothing was there. Finally, uh, a CSF was done and uh, it was diagnosed as a case of um, responsive meningitis arthritis because it had neutrophilic pleocytosis, more of neutrophils in the CSF. And uh, the prognosis for SRME is fat to good. Of course, if you start the treatment early, it is fat. Um, and uh, you have initially when the signs are very acute and painful, you can start the prednisolone at uh, four milligram per kg per day. If two, three days you do it, and then you bring it down to two milligram daily for around uh, two weeks. Then after two weeks, uh, you just reduce it to one milligram. Then you, uh, with the one milligram dose for nearly four to six weeks, you reevaluate the patient. Uh, if uh, it's not showing much signs and uh, CSF is not showing uh, any neutrophilic pleocytosis, then you can reduce the dose and bring it down to uh, 0.5 every day. And then you can still reduce it to alternate days or every 48 hours. Uh, that means that the alternate days or once in three days. And the treatment should be stopped around six months of age. Um, uh, that is after making sure there is no signs uh, related to SRMA. This dog actually it responded very well and it went in for nearly eight months. Uh, this treatment was stopped around six months and uh, after an, around three or four months later, uh, it had some signs. Again, we started with steroids, but unfortunately, since it had a renal issues, a, uh, after a year of starting treatment, it passed away. Okay, that is about SRMA. Uh, uh, that is steroid responsive meningitis arthritis. I'm just dealing with the diseases which are treatable and uh, which can be at least uh, partly diagnosed or suspected. This can be there because uh, we don't have access to MRIs or CTs easily. Coming to idiopathic uh, epilepsy, uh, that you all know, this is. Uh, very commonly seen in certain breeds like uh, shepherds, uh, uh, gold retrievers, uh, 
because of the hereditary predisposition. Idiopathic means it is of uncertain etiology. That means it shouldn't have any other disease of brain or any injury to brain. That is what you call it as idiopathic epilepsy. For some unknown reason or uncertain etiology, it develops epilepsy. Uh, a seizure is something abnormal activity happening in the brain. It can be a sudden episode. There will be uh, neurological signs such as involuntary muscle uh, movements and uh, sensory disturbances as well as altered consciousness. Seizure can be a generalized seizure if it is involving both the cerebral hemispheres or it can be a, a partial seizures if it is involving only specific areas of brain. And uh, uh, this is a, a classical one uh, with vocalization. You see uh, this type of seizures, but generally it won't vocalize much. Uh, okay, that's very pathetic to hear. Uh, I should have put a better video of it. Okay, so uh, seizures, there are different uh, stages in seizures. Uh, the actual seizure, we call it as ictus, which is a synonym for seizure. And aura is the, which comes before that. That is a subjective sensation that precedes the seizures. And uh, you will you will come to know that it is having it's going to develop seizures. Any uh, owner, uh, pet parent who is uh, having a, a pet with seizures uh, or epilepsy, they they will understand that it is going to develop epilepsy, and uh, before actually it happens because they'll be watching him with some degree, some change in behavior they can understand. And uh, then it comes the after uh, ictus, that is the actual seizures, you'll have the post-ictal phase, that the, it is a recovery phase. Um, uh, it will have some degree of altered uh, consciousness. Still, the animal will be a little disoriented rather than normal. After some time, it will be normal. It'll, it is an episode, it is not happening continuously. Um, uh, any period between two seizures, we call it as an interictal period. And how you define epilepsy is actually epilepsy defined as having two unprovoked seizures more than 24 hours. Okay. Two seizures 24 hours apart, we call it as epilepsy. So it is not the same term. Okay. Coming to etiology of seizures, it, it can be an intracranial or extracranial. In case of intracranial, idiopathic. That is what we are going to deal with it. Or it can be inaccurate, maybe because of brain injury or any type of uh, progressive brain disease like a GME, NME, all those ill uh, seizures. Or it can be due to toxins, uh, which can be an external toxin like a poisoning with OP, OPC, carbamates, chocolates, uh, lead, uh, many things which can damage the brain tissues. Or it can be an internal, like uremic encephalopathy, hepatic encephalopathy, anything can end up with seizures. And, um, or it can be a, a hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, or it can be a time and deficiency, which can uh, uh, cause a defect in energy metabolism leading to seizures. So if you want to say it's idiopathic, you have to rule out all those causes. Hatred Pharma introduces Hatcord MP, Methyl Prednisolone 8 mg tablets, the ultimate power of glucocorticoids in more potent form. Methyl Prednisolone tablets, Hatcord MP tablets, glucocorticoid systemic drug. Indications anti inflammatory and immunosuppressive. Dosage for dogs. 0.5 mg to 1 mg per kg per day for cats 1 to 2 mg per kg per day root oral presentation 1 into 10 tablets you can book your order online at www.hatford.com looking forward to a long lasting business association thank you either through history or through your uh, testing then you declare it as an idiopathic disease. So you should follow a general uh, protocol. So uh, just a few points, a few points about uh, how to take a history in epileptic drug or how to take a history in a, a seizure episodes. So you just ask them, 
when was the first seizure just to establish how long the problem was what does the seizure look like from start to finish uh, just to understand whether it's a partial seizures or uh, uh, it's a classical uh, generalized seizures and if possible every time you ask the owner to get a video of it so that you have a uh, look at it uh, so that's more invaluable than ask take getting it from history and uh, whether seizure affect uh, uh, all of the body at once that is whether it's a partial or a or it's a symmetrical or asymmetrical type of seizures and um, and every time the seizure is the same as it happens that, that the type that how it happens every time is it the same or different then you can understand whether it's a stereotypy or a related to seizures are there any autonomic signs like uh, vomiting salivation urination defecation these are all uh, these are all uh, uh, signs which will say it's a seizure sometimes you will get confused whether it's a seizure or a, a type of a stereotypy or is it a syncope all those things you differentiate uh, if it is urinating salivating and defecating more most most probably it is a, a seizure and how long the seizure the ictus last whether it is seizure ictus means very specifically how long that uh, convulsions you see not involving the aura or the post ictal period how long exactly it happens usually it will be 2 to 3 minutes sometimes even longer in case of status epilepticus it will be continuous you all know about it and <clears throat> how long does the animal take to recover and what signs does it have a seizure is a continuous event that is repetitive event uh, usually 5 to 30 minutes that's too long and once it is over it will be quite hungry and thirsty that means it has spent lot of energy and uh, uh, dehydrated those are all the things uh, it will give a clue whether after immediately after that episode which is going in for asking food or drinks lot of water all those things will give a clue and what time of the day does uh, seizure occur uh, maybe uh, you can uh, identify or you can think about an inciting cause or uh, what i can say not the cause exactly the fact um, uh, a predisposing factor or so most of the time without any excitement even the animals lying peacefully either in the evening or morning only it will get seizures that's very common with in case of idiopathic epilepsy so usually when there is a collapse during exercise most commonly it can't be a seizure it can be a syncope and does anything triggers like anxiety exercise or uh, excitement all those things uh, you have to look into it is the dog normal between seizures so if it is abnormal between seizures then we can think about actually some intracranial pathology is happening it may not be an idiopathic uh, epilepsy because it is consistently showing some signs or other of the cns and intermittently it's developing seizures so if the dog is absolutely normal between two episodes mostly it will be an idiopathic epilepsy uh, so you want to know how many seizures has happened if there is any previous injury to rule out head trauma whether the diet is in balance or any in a, 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 a unbalanced i mean non appropriate diet is causing this um any other uh, comorbidities like inflammatory bowel disease uh, which may aggravate the seizures all those things you can rule out other systemic signs medical surgical all those treatments you have to understand then you have to inquire about the vaccination history once you have obtained a history then you have uh, do a clinical examination then a regular a proper neurological examination to see any signs related to existing signs of the brain is there and also you have to rule out uh, other causes uh, like a hepatic failure or a kidney failure which can cause epilepsy so those things you have to rule out A regular hematology and uh, if possible you can go for an advanced imaging like mri or ct 
just uh, make sure that this is an idiopathic epilepsy that it's not possible just leave it you do a urine analysis you do a csf analysis everything just to rule out other causes of epilepsy once you ruled out then you fix it up it's a case of idiopathic epilepsy okay so now after uh, doing all those uh, diagnostic workup and you have concluded that is uh, clearly an uh, epilepsy of uncertain etiology you are not uh, able to corner any lesions then you will have a problem when to start the treatment actually suppose if you think there is any structural lesion in the brain uh, naturally you have to start immediately because it cannot be an idiopathic and wait for it, uh, other episodes uh, and also if it's a repetitive uh, seizures or a status epilepticus uh, more than uh, five minutes or three minutes uh, more generalized seizures even happening quite often with, within 24 hours uh, many times it's happening we call it as cluster seizures all those things warrants immediate uh, starting of the treatment usually it's oral no generally but if it's a status epilepticus we uh, try to start injectables and then you stabilize it and then start the oral uh, in case of an idiopathic epilepsy which is having a, a rare episodes if the episodes are two or more within six months period you have to start the treatment and even if it's a single episode, if it's lasting longer, then it, it warrants treatment. So maybe it's less than a minute and happening uh, once in six months, no need to start, you can wait. Suppose if it happening for a longer time, once in six months, naturally you have to treat it. If it happens twice or thrice in a six months period, then you have to start the treatment. Okay. Sorry for this, it's very small. Uh, just you have to wake up and carefully look at those uh, slides. The first drug of choice, what we use here is the phenomobitol. You, the fame of the brand name one we call it as a Gardenol. That's what we commonly use it here. The phenomobitol is the first line of treatment. Usually I prefer. And the initial starting dose will be around 2.5 milligram every 12 hours. And by around two weeks, I'll check the serum level of phenobarbital. And around six weeks, I check. And once I stabilize the doses, then I'll check every six months. Or if you are trying to increase or decrease the uh, dose, then after two weeks, you necessarily have to check it. And we try to maintain a range of between 45 to 35. Actually, it is, uh, sorry, 15 to 35. Uh, actually, between 15 to 40, 45 range, you can go, but lower the dose, it's better. You can give a prolonged uh, therapy. So once you are using this, if you are combining with the levetiracetam or zonisamide, you have to reduce the dose because it will increase the clearances of levetiracetam or zonisamide. And the main complication with phenobarbital is it uh, can cause hepatotoxicity, some idiosyncratic blood dysgiasis, or it can cause necrotic dermatitis. And as an add-on, it can be used on all type of seizures, uh, any, any etiology, you can use it as an add-on also. Add-on in sense, you can combine with the red dex, you then can combine levator system or you can combine with zonosamide. Suppose if there is a elevated a hepatic enzymes, uh, you won't prefer zonosamide, you prefer levator system because uh, uh, liver metabolism is very minimal with levator system, mostly renal. So better go with uh, levator system. Then your uh, potassium bromide, uh, I'm not very fond of it. Generally, I very rarely use it. But many vets I've seen, they are using potassium bromide. It can be used as a monotherapy as well as, as an add-on therapy with other drugs. It can be uh, usually for a neuropathic epilepsy, that's another uh, next uh, preferred choice. And we don't prefer uh, as an add-on when there is a liver disease. Add-on to fear of it, I mean to say. And uh, that is the range of 1,000 to 300 microgram. You can test and you can maintain it. The initial dose will be around 40 milligram per kg per day. Then comes a uh, amipitoin. Amipitoin, amy, amipitoin is not available in India. That is a newer drug which is very commonly practiced abroad. And it is as good as phenobarbital. Um, I cannot talk much on it because we are not using it. It's a veterinary drug. Then comes your levetiracetam. Levetiracetam, very commonly we use. 
uh, if it is an hepatic in, hepatic involvement is there along with the, this one, we start with levetiracept directly. If it is not there, if it's a, uh, lower values are fine, then we start with phenobarbitone. If it is not coming around with phenobarbitone as a monotherapy, after attaining uh, the regular serum levels, we add uh, levetiracetam. Uh, it, it, suppose if you are giving phenobarbital and uh, without any obvious reason, suddenly animal develops epilepsy. That means maybe even the owner's part, they may not be giving it properly. It may develop the cluster seizures or status epilepticus. Then you can think about uh, uh, using levetiracetam as injectable and then adding as an oral agent. Then you have Zubinet use a, as a monotherapy or as an add-on therapy. And you have, uh, you, you have, uh, don't have a veterinary ranges for that. Uh, it is given as 10 to 40 microgram per liter. I don't, it's an extrapolation from the human thing. You can use that one. And the starting dose is uh, 5 milligram as a monodra, monotherapy. Suppose if you're combining with a phenobobiton, then you have to increase the dose to 7 to 10 milligram because as I said, uh, phenobobiton will uh, increase the clearance of levetiracetam as well as zonisamide. So whenever you are combining with uh, this one, you have to increase the dose, not decreasing dose. Okay. So that is about the uh, medical management of it. There is a newer thing, which is uh, again, uh, it's a vagal nerve stimulation. We are not practicing it. Maybe just to give an information about it, I'm, I've included this. I, it is, uh, we call it as vagal nerve stimulation. It is something like a pacemaker. We put it uh, uh, in the cervical, left cervical vagus nerve nearer to it so that it repeatedly stimulates it. Um, something like it modulates the noradrenergic and cholinergic synaptic uh, transmission, uh, thereby bringing down the episodes of uh, epilepsy. They have some work in dog also, they have, uh, they have done. And uh, it is not completely arresting it, but the frequency of epilepsy is controlled with it. Okay. So now I'm going in for the status epilepticus. So it can happen with any toxins or any type of sepsis uh, or any type of... Uh, uh, even a high temperature, prolonged temperature can end up in status epilepticus. Uh, an ischemic stroke, we call it as a, a cerebral stroke, can end up in status epilepticus. So all those things will end up in status epilepticus. Apart from idiopathic, idiopathic epilepsy also can end up in status epilepticus if it is not properly treated. So in that case, it is an emergency how to manage it. So the first step you will do with a diasperm or with a metazolum. At the dose rate of 0.5 to 2 milligram, you can give IV or uh, intranasally or intrarectally if you don't have an IV access. Or if the own at home, if the owner says it's having a status epilepticus, you can advise intrarectally or intranasally. If it's a metasolum, another route is available, IM. Don't use diastrum intramuscularly. Intrarectal is better than uh, um, using uh, uh, intramuscularly. And if the epilepsy stops with it, it's fine. If it is stopped, then you can start the uh, parental maintenance with the phenobarbitone or with levetiracetam. Any drug you can start. Suppose if it is continuing, epilepsy continues, then you have to start with the CRI of diasum around 0.1 to 0.5 milligram per kg per hour. So, just a minute. So, still it continues with that. Then you have to start with propofol around uh, 2 milligram per kg as a bolus, followed by CRIF around. Usually, we use around 0.3 milligram per kg per minute. That's the ideal dose you have to use for CRI. <clears throat> with other supportives, like uh, if it is a uh, hypoglycemic, then you supplement some glucose. If and is uh, um, uh, hypoxic, then you put it under oxygen. Uh, you can follow it up maybe around, you can follow it up even 48 hours, uh, 78 hours, you can follow it up. 
with this propofol. If it stops with the propofol, then you can continue give, doing a uh, parenteral phenobarbital or levator system. And sometimes we combine along with the propofol, we combine levator system also as enjoyable as a loading dose of around 40 to 60 milligram uh, initially, followed by 20 milligram TID as an injectable. You can use it. Till it continues, then you put it under isofluorine. That's the way. I think it should respond to isofluorine. Usually, if it is not uh, still with propofol, or I'll try to every two hours after infusion, I'll try to with uh, stop the propofol, wait for a few minutes whether uh, any uh, signs of uh, status epilepsy or signs of epilepsy is there. Uh, initially, maybe for the first thing, first uh, stoppage, it may have around uh, after five minutes it develops epilepsy. Then again, I'll continue. Next time, after two hours, I stop and see. Maybe half an hour, it may not have epilepsy, and again it starts. So like that, slowly you can withdraw and see whether it is developing uh, epilepsy. If it develops, you can continue it. And once uh, you stop after a period of two hours and then check it, maybe for two three hours it's not developing, then you can switch over to regular injectables. So that is about the idiopathic epilepsy. So uh, to be uh, to summarize idiopathic epilepsy, it is a, a disease of uncertain etiology. You have to rule out uh, other causes causing epilepsy. Once you are sure there is no other cause, uh, or at least whatever possible causes you can rule out, once you ruled out, then you can think about it may be an idiopathic. And uh, then you assess the frequency of epilepsy. It happens uh, uh, maybe two to three times in six months of time. Then it's better to start. Uh, even an episode which is a more prolonged episode, we start with the treatment. Usually the drug of choice will be phenobarbitone sodium. Once uh, the phenobarbitone is uh, uh, given, then you just monitor it and continue with it. Uh, once it is under control, just keep on maintaining. It's a lifelong medication. You cannot discontinue it. Uh, and, uh, generally, at no point of time, we will we'll discontinue it because once you discontinue, it's very difficult to uh, bring it back to the previous uh, stabilized levels. Okay. Then coming to the vestibular disease, <clears throat> that is a very common thing you come across. Um, there is no uh, much specific treatment for this. It is along with the primary disease you treat this. Symptomatically, you can uh, treat certain drugs. And as you all know, the vestibular apparatus there in the uh, inner ear, it is the, that is the semi-lunar uh, you see here, and then you see a cochlear Those are all have, having the receptors there. And once it senses and it passes to the vestibular nuclei here, which maintains a balance, the vestibular nuclei is in the um, uh, brainstem as well as in the uh, cerebellum, this area. To, to act in an opposite fashion to maintain balance. So if there is any problem with this apparatus, then you develop a vestibular disease. How it maintains is um, to the spinal cord via the vestibulospinal uh, tract uh, to the ipsilateral extensors of the limbs so that it maintains the balance of the limbs. Hadrid Pharma introduces Hadclav DS Serum, Amoxicillin 400 mg, Potassium Provenate 57 mg per 5 ml, Bacterial Amino Penicillin with Beta Lactamase Inhibitor with Extended Spectrum of Antibacterial Activity, Amoxicillin and Potassium Provenate Oral Suspension, Hadclav DS, Potentiated Amino Penicillin Systemic Drug. Indications Broad spectrum antibiotic for bacterial infections, skin, soft tissue, and UTI infections. Dosage for dogs 13.75 mg per kg for every 12 hours. For cats 62.5 mg per cat every 12 hours. Root Oral. Presentation 30 ml. You can book your order online at www.hatwit.com.
Looking forward to a long lasting business association. Thank you. And uh, to the eye muscle, especially to keep the eyeball in position. To the forebrain for conscious proprioception. Once you do a conscious proprioception, that is just bending the uh, and then waiting for it to correct it. Um, that happens uh, because how it knows it is not having the correct position is because of the uh, sensation from the forebrain, which is through the vestibular apparatus. And to the cerebellum for the coordination of eye, neck, body, limbs in relation to the head. So, and to the reticular formation of the brain stem for the vomiting and motion sickness. These are all the role of the vestibular apparatus. Once, um, what are the reasons for vestibular disease? So, as I said, it can be a peripheral or a central vestibular disease. Peripheral means involving only those uh, uh, and the central means involving the vestibular nuclei. And uh, if it is a degenerative, generally you don't have much a peripheral disease. It's a, a storage disease. We call it as a lysosomal storage disease. It's a inherited disease. Uh, it's something like a metabolic defect in the body, uh, which is involving the brain also. It can happen in liver as well as in the whole body or in the brain. That can cause degenerative changes in the brain. It can be a congenital. Uh, that's very rare, causing peripheral, but it can uh, cause a central vestibular disease because of hydrocephalus. Uh, or the, this is another uh, type of malformation. It can be a metabolic because of the hypothyroidism. Um, uh, sorry, it can be metabolic uh, due to hypothyroidism. Either it can be peripheral or central, either way. And uh, usually it is the vestibular disease the hypothyroidism causes. In case of a idiopathic epilepsy, still you see a low thyroid. That's a euthyroid sickness, not because of the um, uh, uh, abnormal levels of uh, uh, normal thyroid uh, uh, function. But once you measure the levels, it is low. That is because of the anticonvulsant we use in case of an uh, idiopathic epilepsy. Uh, you call it as a euthyroid sickness. And in case of a neoplastic disease, a peripheral, it is because of the vestibular nerve sheath tumor or something from the oral cavity that is uh, around the teeth, uh, uh, neoplasia extending there. Or it can mean intracranial neoplasia causing the central vestibular disease. Nutritional doesn't usually cause peripheral, but it causes uh, central, especially in case of a time deficiency. And an idiopathic one, which happens uh, in the case of old dogs, which is mostly peripheral, not central. And uh, there is no much treatment for this, only symptomatic treatment. I'll tell you what, meclizin usually we use to follow. And coming to infectious and inflammatory, usually it is otitis media or interna causing the peripheral vestibular disease. And the central vestibular disease, mainly because of distemper or in case of early shosis, anaplasmosis, toxoplasmosis, um, fungal like cryptosporidosis, blastomycosis, all those things and causes the central vestibular disease. Coming to a toxic, any ototoxic drugs like, you, as you all know, aminoglycosides, uh, which can cause a peripheral vestibular disease, damaging the apparatus in the ear. But whereas a metronidazole toxicity can cause a central peripheral disease, sorry, central vestibular disease. And trauma to the uh, petrous temporal bone can uh, cause a peripheral disease. Uh, trauma to brain stem or the cerebellum can cause central vestibular disease. And uh, usually vascular, that is ischemic uh, attack, that is uh, like stroke, uh, it won't cause a peripheral vestibular disease. Instead, it causes a central vestibular disease. It can be an ischemic stroke or it can be hemorrhagic uh, thing. Hemorrhagic accident can also uh, cause a central vestibular disease. So these are some of the etiologies behind vestibular disease. So very commonly, a peripheral vestibular disease is because of otitis media or interna, and sometimes with the uh, ototoxic drugs or with the hypothyroidism. And in any age dog, maybe after 10 or 12 years of age, if it develops peripheral vestibular disease, then it should be an idiopathic. Coming to central vestibular disease, 
it can be a, a congenital one or it can be a viral etiology or it can be a thiamine deficiency or it can be because of metronidazole toxicity or it can be a trauma to brain stem or it can be an ischemic stroke okay what will be the clinical signs of vestibular disease um it is actually the head tilt which is very predominant sign you you have shown a lot of you have seen a lot of cases of head tilt you, that, that's a typical head tilt one year below the other this developed because of the early issues it was early issues positive it was a puppy and uh, this video you just see this is because of the metronidazole toxicity once metronidazole was withdrawn after a uh, few weeks it, it in fact it recovered from that it was a central slowly it was recovering it was at the dose of around 40 mg per kg intravenously and this was a nystagmus this had a oligodendroglioma it had a type of neoplasm it can have strabismus or ataxia okay so once a case uh, is presented with uh, uh, head tilt or uh, signs of vestibular disease, head tilt, circling, whatever you see, then you, you always have a doubt whether it's a central or peripheral. There are very few simple tests which can, which can differentiate so that you can think about the etiology. It's a little different you know, in that sense. Um, head tilt, usually it is towards the side of the lesion in both central and peripheral. Only in case of central, sometimes in case of a cerebellar involvement, it can be away from the lesion uh, because of the paradoxical head tilt. Uh, we are not going to deal with it. So head tilt is seen in both usually, so you can't differentiate. Nystagmus, usually it's seen in both and some claim vertical nystagmus is usually seen in central only. It's very difficult to say it's vertical or rotary or horizontal, whatever it is. But when you do a partial reaction testing, uh, you do a conscious proprioception or hemi standing, hemi walking, all those things. Those tests are to bring out the subtle neurological signs into light. So if it has a proprioceptive deficit, then possibly it should be central. So the first point to differentiate between peripheral and central is the proprioceptive deficit. And uh, both can have honus, but not so common with the uh, uh, central. We are not going to deal with honus also. Already in the earlier session, in the primary session, I told something on honus syndrome. Coming to consciousness, it will be normal mentation. Very rarely you see a disoriented dog with peripheral vestibular disease, but in central, you will have altered mentation. So, mostly 90% of the dogs will show postural deficit. 50% uh, of dogs will show altered mentation in case of central lesion. And of course, as I said, uh, you, except for the cranial nerve 7, most of the cranial nerve sets you see only the central. So because all those cranial nerve nuclei all starts from the brainstem. So three differentiating points between the central and the peripheral. One, the central will have proprioceptive deficit, whereas the peripheral, it won't have proprioceptive deficit. The central will have altered mentation. Usually, it's a normal mentation of peripheral. The central will have multiple cranial nerve deficits, usually, which is not seen in the peripheral. Only maybe a cranial nerve seven uh, signs may be seen, but usually it is not seen. So, once you differentiate with the central or peripheral, then you can identify uh, probable etiology. Mostly, it is the otitis media or internal peripheral. Okay, so how to treat it? First, you, had, you diagnose the primary disease and address the primary issue. In case of an idiopathic uh, peripheral vestibular disease, uh, uh, you can use meclizin, hydrochloride, which will symptomatically, uh, and as it uh, go treated for a few weeks, it'll recover, or even without treatment, it may recover without any issues. Uh, you can use uh, ondansetron or uh, chlorpromazine. Uh, this was anti emetics we can use. Um, and uh, the disease is very severe, like uh, rolling, uh, all those things, and it's uh, very difficult to feed him, or he's not feeding on his own. Then you uh, think about uh, treating with fluid therapy. And sometimes, if rolling is very severe, sometimes it'll continuously rolling. This rolling is very severe. Then think about anesthetizing and keeping for a while. 
so that it corrects on human there are a lot of physical techniques to correct it uh, positioning the patient but uh, that is not so common with the uh, veterinary patients and we are not trying to do those things uh, that's a very delicate thing how to position the patient uh, uh, that that are types of man different maneuvers uh, for vestibular disease available with the uh, human patients okay then coming to the uh, brain tumors the uh, primary brain tumors uh, are uh, around 50 percent secondary brain tumors around 50 percent generally uh, among the primary meningiomas are very common um, then comes your uh, gliomas uh, especially the it's a uh, oligodendroglioma which is more common and also you have a uh, choroid plexus tumors and the secondary that is a metastatic lesions usually is from hemangiosarcoma i have seen uh, the meninges are now spreading to both the ventricles and of course lymphoma and the other metastatic carcinomas as you see in the mammary tumors and other tumors and of course you all know about it it's very difficult to treat uh, brain tumors it's mostly a surgical or a radiation therapy very rarely it responds to the chemos then coming to canine stroke yeah just i i'll touch this and I, um see brain almost takes the 20 percent of the cardiac output and 15 percent of the oxygen when the body is at rest even though it weighs only two percent of the body weight so you can imagine uh, how the circulation has to be maintained for the brain so any obstruction any transient obstruction or a permanent obstruction leading to uh, ischemia or any rupture of the blood vessels inside leading to hemorrhage will end up in uh, what you call it as a stroke so it can be an atherosclerosis but very rarely you see in dogs uh, mostly it is a sepsis with thrombi it can happen in hypothyroidism it can be in a hypo lipoproteinemia or it can be because of sepsis leading to the uh, coagulopathies and then the thrombus or emboli causing it can be a neoplasia in the brain or it can be a heart forms uh, causing uh, embolism all those can obstruct the vasculatures to the brain and cause a ischemic attack a chronic hypertension uh, which can be a primary or a secondary uh, usually primary is very uh, less than 15 percent or we can call it as less than 10 percent canines usually it is a secondary mostly because of a ckd or uh, due to cushions um, uh, or it can be an uh, intracranial hemorrhage uh, related to hypertension. Uh, that is the, uh, hypertension causing an intracranial hemorrhage leading to stroke. It can be an intracranial tumors, vasculitis, or uh, any coagulopathies leading to stroke. Once you see a stroke, when, there is, when the signs are very acute, like uh, epilepsy, hypoxia, then naturally you have to address it as an emergency before the damage is uh, permanent uh, usually the signs will be per acute acute and one set mostly with a, uh, with forebrain lesion it will be a simple disorientation to death it can be anything and uh, a unilateral lesion uh, that is on one side induce ipsilateral circling the circling on same side lesion that is ipsilateral circling hemi inattention syndrome this uh, if the lesion is on the left side the right side wall doesn't exist if you keep a feed on this uh, wall you can see only one half is eaten up the other half is left untouched uh, this is because of the hemi intention syndrome it can have a contralateral central blindness what do you mean by central blindness you will have a normal pupillary gate reflex but still the animal will be blind this is what you call it as a central blindness as well as you can have a contralateral the opposite side of the lesion ataxia contralateral propulsive deficits all those things is a sign of a stroke so uh, contralateral uh, proposed deficit or it can be bilateral also if the lesion is multifocal but generally it will be a uh, unilateral lesion uh, it, uh, involving uh, specific areas of the brain so uh, it will be an ipsilateral circling on the same side of the lesion and hemi attention syndrome that is on the contralateral side it can be a contralateral central blindness as well as contralateral ataxia or a proposed deficit and of course seizures so initially when the case is presented the acute seizures uh, and uh, uh, it animal is hypoxic then first thing your oxygen and put it under uh, anti-epileptic drugs injectables 
wait for the signs to improve. So once uh, you do a stroke is there, you do a thyroid function just to check whether it's hypothyroid. Then you can do a coagulation profile to check uh, any hypercoagulability is there. Then a systolic blood pressure just to rule out uh, the reasons for uh, just to identify hypertension and then to uh, other blood parameters to rule out the possible secondary causes. You have to go in for ECG to just check whether any type of arrhythmias which is causing a transient ischemic attacks of the brain. Then you have to do a CT or an MRI. So there is no specific treatment for infarcts or intracranial hemorrhages. So you have to maintain a good cerebral perfusion that is by improving the systemic blood pressure. Um, you can uh, hydrate the animal properly. You can use pressure agents to improve the blood pressure. You can improve the uh, uh, tissue oxygenation by putting in oxygen. You can manage the seizures and then treat the underlying causes. Um, thereby, you can manage stroke. Managing stroke in the acute phase is more important and then gradually it improves on its own. So, with this, I complete the uh, diseases of the brain. Thank you. Uh... Hatred Pharma Private Limited is a pharmaceutical company with its head office at Meerut. It was founded on 29 January 2019 with a vision to provide affordable and quality veterinary medicine to our pet parents. Hatfit Pharma is doing marketing of veterinary pharmaceuticals throughout India. In a small span of one year, we have launched 51 products in the veterinary pharma industry to serve our clients. In future one year, we are planning to have a product basket of more than 100 products. Hatfit is different from other veterinary pharma companies as we don't have distribution channel. We understand the latest needs of market and for this reason we have adapted to online module of selling our drugs to field practitioners. We are serving our clients by providing the required medicines at their doorstep without any middleman. We directly collect orders online, mobile app, whatsapp, telephonic from our end customers and we deliver the required products to their doorstep through our nationwide logistic partners Blue Dart, DTDC, TCI Express. We are happy to announce that in our client list, most of the leading pet practitioners of India are included. To assure the unbreakable faith of our clients in our company products, we look after the quality of products, starting from selecting the raw material for our final products, aseptic precautions during manufacturing, and proper storage of finished products still supply to the end customers to ensure quality of products. We are happy to share that Hatfit Pharma has been recognized at various business platforms. Recently, an article on Hatfit Pharma has been published in the leading business magazine, Business Connect. One more milestone in the success story for Hatfit Pharma is that the managing director of the company, Dr. Rajneesh Tyagi, has been awarded Young Asian Entrepreneurs Award at Bangkok, Thailand on 7 February 2020. Our vision states Hatfit Pharma to be a commercially viable leading veterinary pharmaceutical company in providing quality products affordable to various sections of the pet owner society. Our endeavor is to be a front runner in innovation and quality in the veterinary pharma industry. We see a very bright future for our company as we are working in pet industry which itself is growing at a higher rate, approximate growth of 20% annually. We are regularly working on the knowing of needs of our customers to serve them in a better way. We value your support to Hatfit Pharma and are very thankful to all of you. We look forward for a very strong and long business association between veterinarians and Hatwit Pharma. Thank you.